15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Our second reading is from Matthew 6, verses 7 through 15. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I want to share with you this morning on the topic, Christians forgive. And I'm drawn to my topic by two verses in particular. First, the wonderful 20th verse of Genesis 50. Even though you intended to do harm to me, this is Joseph speaking to his brothers, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. And also the 14th verse of the sixth chapter of Matthew, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Christians, forgive. Native Bible scholar Stephen Westerholm to find forgiveness in the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible when he wrote, forgiveness is the act by which an offended party removes an offense from further consideration, thereby reestablishing the basis for a harmonious relation with the offender. Ultimately, however, all sins, all sins, including wrongs done to other human beings, are committed against God. Now, you may be asking yourself, and I certainly did when I first encountered this idea, how can anyone say that a failure to forgive is ultimately a sin against God. But the answer is simple, and it can really make sense once you hear it. God's, God's original intention in creating the earth and all people who live on it was a peaceful and loving community, a peaceful and loving spiritual family. When you and I surrender our hearts, our minds, and our wills to the heat of raging hate, when we let our negative emotions be like roaring, flashing flames to consume those we have decided to resent and despise, then we are corrupting and disrupting 
our peaceful and loving community, our peaceful and loving spiritual family, our corrupting, disrupting, and destructing means we are destroying what God wants. We are demolishing what God builds. And we are denying what God wills for us in God's divine creativity and love. Christians forgive is an exhortation to cast off the chains of any vicious and hateful emotions and to embrace the power of reconciliation. Many might consider what I'm urging to be impossible, and I suspect that in some cases, you may be right. But what is impossible for us is not impossible for the triune God, Father, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the key to unlocking that divine and heavenly power, the key to unlocking that divine and heavenly power is prayer. The triune God can give us courage and strength that we do not have when we are unaided and alone. The triune God can give us decisiveness and determination that we do not have without God's help. The prophet Jeremiah famously proclaimed God's forgiveness in the passage that celebrated the new covenant that God was making with the chosen people. No longer, Jeremiah said, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The prophet Micah celebrated God's mercy and love when he wrote, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of your possession. He, meaning God, does not retain his anger forever because, why? Because he delights in showing clemency. The Apostle Paul applied the need for and the beauty of forgiveness in this epistle to the church at Ephesus. <laughs> and be kind, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The author of the epistle of 1 John wrote, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The famous 16th century English poet and translator Thomas Watson was so well known in his day that Shakespeare was once described as his heir. Watson once wrote, we do not climb up into heaven to see whether our sins are forgiven. We just don't do that. Let us look into our hearts and see if we can forgive others. If we can, we need not doubt but God has forgiven us. The famous 19th century minister and theologian Horace Bushnell, especially, I was especially pleased to, to see his first name. Do you realize I, I'm one of the few Horaces I know? <laughs> Horace Bushnell was pastor, was a pastor in Hartford, Connecticut until he resigned for reasons of ill health and devoted himself to writing. <laughs> 
Bushnell once wrote, forgiveness, forgiveness is humanity's deepest need and highest achievement. Wow. Forgiveness is humanity's deepest need and highest achievement. The famous 20th century Welsh minister, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, was minister of the Westminster Chapel in London for nearly 30 years. Lloyd-Jones once wrote, once wrote, the man or woman who is truly forgiven and knows it is the man or woman who forgives. The man who is truly forgiven and knows it is a man or woman who forgives. In a recent book, Fred Craddock shared the following personal story based on his own spiritual experience. Craddock wrote, I recall as a youngster, I recall as a youngster, as a junior and senior in high school, going to a summer conference at Bethany Hills near Nashville, Tennessee. That was the conference ground, the conference ground where the young people of Tennessee went. I remember the closing night, a consecration night, we gathered around the lake and everybody held one of those little candles with a piece of cardboard so the tallow wouldn't drip down on your hand and make you say a bad word. By the way, tallow is, and I quote, a hard, fatty substance made from rendered animal fat used in making candles and soaps. Okay, Mr. Craddock, I just had to straighten that out. By the way, I remember going to a uh, evening service, youth service, actually, I think, at, at the Idaho Presbyterian Church many years ago. And they had these candles and, and little cardboard thingies that you stuck them in and you held it up. And the idea was that you wouldn't burn your hand or whatever. Well, to make a long story short, that rascal melted onto my hand and hurt. Are you kidding me? What's even worse, I had on my favorite sport coat. I was so proud of that sport coat. And the tallow dripped onto the wool. And, and you moms and grandmoms who ever tried to get tallow, melted tallow out of a wool coat, it, 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 it's almost impossible. All right, I got off my son. Craddock continued. There was a fire at the end of the lake and there was the cross in a worship service. And after the last song, we were to go to the dormitories and not say a word until breakfast. It was a night of silence, of meditation and reflection. I remember that we sang all the stanzas of Are Ye Able? There were people in my junior year in high school, I remember several people went up and gave their lives to Christian ministry. We said full-time Christian service. It was already chewing on me, wrote Craddock. It was already working on me. And as I went to the dorm and lay on my cot, wide awake, couldn't sleep, what would it be like to give your life to the gospel? Are you able to drink the cup? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Are you able to give your life? Seems wonderful. I had all these ideal images of what it would be like to give your life. The third verse of the hymn by Earl Marlin, former poet laureate of Indiana, that so moved Fred Craddock goes, Are ye able when the anguish Racks your mind and heart with pain. 
to forgive the souls who wrong you, who would make your striving vain. And the refrain answers back, Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. We mold and make us like thee, divine. Thy guiding radiance above us shall be a beacon to God, to love and loyalty. In other words, we can even serve the Lord by forgiving those who hurt us. A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures at the end of Genesis focuses on the story of Joseph and his brothers. They had sold Joseph to a passing Ishmaelite caravan of slave traders, according to Genesis 37, 28. And be patient with me. It's, it's, it's a long process here, at least half a page. In turn, the slave traders had sold to Joseph, had sold Joseph to one of Pharaoh's officials named Potiphar, the captain of the guard, Genesis 37, 36. And next, Joseph master put him in prison for having been tricked into believing that Joseph had attacked his Potiphar's wife, Genesis 39, 20. And finally, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream seven fat cows and seven lean cows and also seven good heads of grain and seven withered heads of grain and that's in Genesis 40. The fat cows and the good heads of grain stood for years of plenty while the lean cows and the withered grain stood for years of famine. In his commentary on Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, Bible scholar John H. Salehim emphasized how the wisdom of Joseph was being able to discern the difference between good and bad. Apparently, it was not just Joseph's ability to interpret the symbolism of Pharaoh's dream, but additionally, Joseph's wisdom to discern the difference between good and bad that led Pharaoh to put Joseph in control of his kingdom. So here was a man whom his brothers had almost killed. Here was a man whom his brothers had sold to the slave traders. Here was a man who had been bought and sold like a piece of property. Here was a man who was put into prison under false pretenses. Yet here was a man who endured it all, survived it all, triumphed over it all. Is it any wonders, wonder that his brothers who had thrown him into a dry pit and considered killing him but compromised by selling him into slavery were terrified? Is it any, any wonder now that the tables were turned that they envisioned a similar suffering for themselves as punishment and retribution? Is it any wonder that his brothers based their appeal on what they claimed was their father's request? Is it any wonder that in their fear and despair, his brothers cast themselves on the ground, on the ground before him, before Joseph, and confess themselves as Joseph's slaves? But here is the man who was second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And he said to his murderous scheming brothers when they came into his presence, and under his power. Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. When you and I pray for the ability to forgive others for whatever wrongs they have perpetrated against us, we would do well to pray for the faith and the strength 
and the courage of Joseph. In our reading from the New Testament, we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taking up the theme with which we concluded in our reading from the Hebrew scriptures, namely prayer. In chapter six, verses five and six, Jesus in the gospel of Matthew is telling us where to pray. The answer to that question is definitely not in public. Where we might be understood is merely showing off. The answer instead is to pray in private in our rooms where we can shut the door. Surely Jesus himself had wrestled with this challenge. His guidance was to be away from distraction, to be away from diversion. Jesus wanted us to be where we could concentrate on God. Have you ever done it? If you ever tried to concentrate on God and God's will and God's love to the exclusion of all else, have you ever focused your mind intensely on that? The initial guidance set the tone for what followed. Jesus urged believers not to overflow with words, not to overflow with entreaties, and not to overflow with questions. He urged them not to pray like the Gentiles because, and I quote, your father, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Is it too much to suggest that Jesus' guidance directs us to focus more on listening than on talking, more on silence, than on noise and more on guidance than on speculation. Jesus then continued what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. In verse 10, Jesus placed special emphasis on the request that your will be done. And, and you know, when I go to the hospital, I, I do pray for healing. I do pray for healing. But I also pray that God's perfect will may be fulfilled. Sometimes God's perfect will does not involve what we want it to involve, does not constitute what we want it to constitute. But there's a reason and there's a purpose in God's mind. Jesus then continued with what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. In verse 10, he said, your will be done. Notice here that the emphasis is not on our will, but on God's will. The emphasis is not on what we want, but on what God wants. The emphasis is not on so much on what we think might be best, but on what God knows and decides would be best. In verse 12, the Lord's Prayer continued with a need to forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And the clear implication of Jesus' words was that our willingness to forgive our debtors will have a decided, decisive impact on how we ourselves will be forgiven. I believe this fear, the fear generated by this verse, has caused enormous confusion. And the way I read it is not, not, underline not three times with red ink, not as a promise of punishment if we fail to forgive others. That's not the Jesus Christ I know. The way I read it is that giving, the giving and receiving of forgiveness both exist in a similar mindset, or if you prefer a similar soul set. If you and I refuse to forgive others, then that refusal also turns off our switch to receive forgiveness. Giving forgiveness requires courage and openness and a willingness to be vulnerable. And I'm suggesting that receiving forgiveness does too. If we resist giving forgiveness, 
we simultaneously create an inner resistance to receiving forgiveness. After all, receiving forgiveness is not a cost-free exercise, enterprise. It involves, receiving forgiveness involves an admission of guilt concerning that which is forgiven. It involves an admission of guilt concerning the pain, damage, and hurt feelings that resulted. It involves an admission of guilt concerning the relationship that was damaged. Can't you, can't you just hear the voices in your head? I feel so bad. I never knew that mattered so much to you. I never knew you cared so deeply. I never knew that that was what had bothered you all this time. So, healing the breach can be complicated and delicate. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus taught that forgiving others can also have an impact on our relationship with God. I would put it this way. To forgive others opens our hearts, minds, and souls to receiving the forgiveness that God wants, wants to give us. Refusing to do that, namely not to forgive others, closes our minds, our hearts, our souls to receiving the forgiveness that God wants to give us. Christians, forgive. Forgiveness can really make a difference. Amen to God be the glory. Thank you.